Tori Nielsen, welcome to Shrinkwrap Radio. Thanks very much. I'm really happy to be with you today. And I'm really happy to have this opportunity to meet you. Um, uh, I'm, and we're going to be discussing a bit of your own your own history and uh, and your work with uh, dreams and dream research, as well as your upcoming keynote presentation with the uh, International Association for the Study of Dreams, or IASD. So uh, we've, we've got a big uh, agenda here. And why don't we start off a bit with your, your background? I, I was official. Initially, I called you uh, Tor, and you said, no, it's Tori, T-O-R-E is Tori, uh, in, in Denmark. So I have to ask, did you grow up in Denmark? Uh, well, yes, I was, uh, I was born in Odense, Denmark, uh, uh, but we, we left Denmark when I was quite young. So really, I was raised in Alberta, and that's where I, my name took on the, the, the pronunciation of Tor. So anyone who hears that uh, and recognizes will be friends from Alberta, Calgary, or Edmonton. Um, but yes, as, when I moved to Quebec... I decided to change it because the word Tor was really a, it may have meant being wrong and I just didn't feel good having that as a name. So yeah, yeah I really compromised. Underst I understand <laughs> that. And yeah. what was it that caused your parents to uh, migrate from uh, Denmark? Uh, Denmark is portrayed as this perfect place these days. True. Uh, well, it was in the fifties and so it was still in the post-war kind of period and my mother who was uh, from Norway um, she was in the uh, the Norwegian underground and so she had quite wow. traumatic experiences fighting the Nazis uh, wow. as a teenager and uh, she escaped I guess you could say from Norway uh, she was looking for something else you know looking for a different context and found that maybe Denmark wasn't the best place either they were sort of cooped up with my dad's family living in the same house they wanted to break out and they uh you know there were communities in canada of scandinavians uh -huh. especially western canada where they had contacts and they went there my dad found work as a carpenter and uh yeah i was raised there okay and um you know so now you work professionally with dreams i'm wondering were you a big dreamer as a kid did that interest start early with you? Uh, I was, and it did start early. And in fact, <laughs> one of my theories about dreaming actually points a finger at the age of uh, three and a half years, if, if you can believe the, the specificity. Yeah. Um, and uh, which is approximately the age I was when we moved. And um, yeah, my theory, and it's based on a lot of good science as well, is that around that age, um, there is a kind of a shift a cognitive shift and an emotional shift in the structure of, of um, sort of memory, um, emotional processing, and so forth. And if there's any important interference around that time, say trauma, adversity, uh, even, you know, s s changes that you might not expect to be adverse, like birth of a, of a sibling or, you know, moving into a new house, that that can actually accelerate this uh, this transfer of uh, cognitive emotional processes and cause it to occur earlier. And that can actually open some gates into remembering dreams and nightmares more than one would. Uh, based on, it, yeah, there's a, a lot of evolutionary theory on the same kind of phenomenon. For example, girls who have been uh, traumatized young, they tend to um, have their, their first periods much earlier than they normally mm -hmm. would. It's as if there's an evolutionary pressure to um, grow up more quickly, if you like, yeah. when you're in periods of adversity. And my theory of nightmares is based on the same idea that this, there's this acceleration due to early stress that causes nightmares to, uh, to um, start to occur and to be more accessible to consciousness. And of course, I started remembering my dreams around three and a half years of age. Wow. So I think the combination of say having a, you know, this post-war stress uh, through my mother and big migration overseas, you know, moving into a new house, et cetera. I think those things probably worked uh, in a similar way on me, causing a, a shift in my own uh, cognitive structure. 
Does, does it have anything to do with brain lateralization? Um, more complex than that. Well, I, I don't know. You know, that was a really interesting hypothesis back in the 70s, 60s, yeah. 70s, maybe. I actually did some work on that. When I first came to Montreal, we looked at people who had a uh, um, single hemisphere removed because of severe epilepsy. They used uh -huh. to do, you know, unilateral excisions of the entire hemisphere. If wow. the yeah. lesions, if the, you know, the epileptic fits were too, too intense. And so we were fortunate enough to, I think, have three people who had uh, right hemisphere excisions and one who had a left hemisphere excision. And we basically studied them in the sleep lab and we asked them to recall their dreams, you know, from REM sleep and so forth. The theory being that the right hemisphere is the dreamer, um, which was sort of common, common belief at the time, you know, the, based on the, the right hemisphere as the artist and so forth. But uh, the alternative theory was really that it's, it's the left hemisphere that's the dreamer because the left hemisphere controls language, uh, comprehension of speech, you know, telling stories and so forth. And um, that's closer to maybe what dreaming is. And uh, surprisingly enough, it turned out that the, um, the three subjects who had the, the right hemisphere uh, excisions, they still dreamed and were able to report their dreams in the lab. And the um, subject with the left hemisphere excision had very seriously reduced dreaming. Wow. So it tended to support the left hemisphere hypothesis more than the yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, that brain lateralization, we've, uh, we've since learned that it was really oversimplified the way that it was presented in a lot of popular writing at that time. But it was such a handy, <laughs> it, was. it felt like such a handy <laughs> categorization. It's true. And the, the work by Gazaniga, uh, with the split brain patients, it was so intriguing to me. I had even developed a, a whole theory of how it's possible, perhaps, that even in intact individuals, that the left and the right hemispheres are dreaming quasi independently at the same time. Wow. And uh, in such a case, you might be able to explain some of the strangeness of dreams, you uh -huh. know, a storyline that progresses, but then there's these weird intrusions and yeah, bizarre yeah. features that kind right. of get stitched in. Sometimes people will even say, it's almost like there were two things happening at once. I can't uh -huh. fit them into a linear you know, sequence. Yeah. And I had, I had all this, these plans to try to uh, get split brain patients to report their dreams sort of one hemisphere at a time. Mm. Propose the questions just to one hemisphere and see, yeah. see if you get the same dream report as if you pose the question to the other hemisphere using tachistoscopic displays and so forth. Wow. But uh, you need access to a lot of um, split brain patients, and we didn't really have such good access. So those theories, they went untested for the longest time, but I still think about them sometimes. Um, what about using some kind of imaging rather, rather than, you know, brain imaging? Uh, technology rather than actual split brain people. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't doubt that you would probably see activity in both hemispheres. If you do brain imaging, um, then you would need to do a careful collection of dreams and the phenomenology of dreams. And uh, yeah, so far people have been reluctant to do serious work on dreaming in relation to brain imaging. There's a lot of work on sleep. It, it, I mean, it's hard enough to get people to sleep in, a, in an MRI uh, because of the noise and so forth. So yeah. it's, <laughs> I've it, been in an MRI. Is that the one I go, like bangs while you're yeah, in there? That's, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's actually possible to fall asleep. I do it multiple times when, I'm, uh, when I have scans. Uh, because of the uh, background noise, for some reason, it's very soporific. Yeah, uh, I think I recall getting sleepy, yeah. Right, but maintaining that to the point where you can get into say uh, uh, your first REM sleep cycle yeah, right. or non-REM sleep, that's much more difficult. And mm -hmm. uh, people tend to just focus on the sleep aspect. They don't tend to ask people their dreams and so forth. There's been a few studies, but really it's a uh, virgin territory yeah. for, uh, for research. Well, take us through your academic history uh, that led up to, you know, you're becoming a, a, a dream researcher and having a sleep lab and all that. All right, sure. Uh, well, the, you know, the vivid dreams and nightmares were always there in the background, lurking all the time, ever since I was three. So for me, uh, a, a rich dream life was always part of my lived experience. And 
a big question mark. But Did you I, start writing them down at any point? Did you uh, keep a dream I, journal? Actually, I don't think I started writing them down until I was in, in university and I met other people. I met, I remember meeting one poet who wrote his dreams down and, and one day sat me down and he started reading his dreams to me and I, I couldn't believe that he actually had been uh, keeping them in a, in a binder and so forth and then turning them into poems and this really uh, appealed to me and I started, yeah, then I started keeping dream records. But I mean, after filling up my nth binder full of <laughs> dream reports, I, I started to realize that there wasn't, there wasn't that good of a reason to do it. I, thought uh -huh. I wasn't doing something with them. Yeah. That's sort of part of my whole point uh, of doing this keynote yeah. we'll talk about later. But that awoken me to the, uh, to the idea of diaries and and the fact that um, we could study them. And I, I started to uh, realize that there was a whole science of dream research going on. And um, when as an I, undergraduate, uh, did you become aware of that? Well, as an, as, a, as an undergraduate, I was more into brain states like alpha. You know, I trained myself to have 100% alpha brain waves and things oh, like really? that. Yeah. yeah. A friend of mine and I, we really experimented on each other. It was only when I... Um, I, I graduated from as an undergrad and went into house building <laughs> that and, and, and had time to read what I wanted to read. And I started reading Freud and Jung and especially the Freud Jung letters was something that really uh, appealed to me that I, I started looking for a program to, um, to you know, continue my interest in dreams. And I decided to actually quit the construction business and I did a tour of Canada I didn't really want to leave the, the Canada for the U.S. And, um, and by chance, by a strange quirk of coincidence, I, uh, I met uh, uh, Don Kuyken at the University of Alberta, and he was just opening a sleep lab. He was looking for somebody to help him build a sleep lab. And I was just right off the old construction circuit, so I, that, that appealed to me. <laughs> wow. Although I ended up doing more programming than I did actual physical building, but I uh -huh. actually programmed an entire software to detect sleep staging on a 6502 uh, machine language computer, which is wow. like a precursor to Apple yeah. computers, like 68,000 oh, yeah. Apple computers. Yeah. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time programming and uh, yeah, built a software. I used it to study people in the sleep lab. Um, we were really interested in lucid dreams, a group of us students and yeah. tried to induce lucid dreams in the laboratory. It was really new at that time, hot off the press. The IASD had just been formed, and uh, you know Stephen Leberge was publishing some of his work yeah. on lucid dreams, and we were trying really hard to induce lucid dreams, and we did. We succeeded using a, a blood pressure cuff. That was our methodology: a simple blood pressure cuff, like the kind that you put on your arm to test blood pressure. But we yeah. got large ones, oversized ones, and we put them on the legs. Because the ones up on the arms tended to crackle because of the Velcro and woke people up. But right. Put them on the legs and we inflated them while people were in REM sleep. And we produced the most uh, insane dreams in the lab. Lucid dreams, but dreams with body transformations. You know, uh, the, the blood, the somatosensory stimulation was really the most effective tool for controlling or in interfering with maybe uh, dream content. Than, that anyone had really uh, come up with up to that point. So, in it, other words, you would uh, inflate the cuff once they were in REM, REM sleep? Right. And, That's right. And it, would, uh, it, and it would not totally wake them up. But it, Well, this is the art of doing it because, <laughs> yes, you can very easily wake up somebody from REM sleep. Their thresholds are actually quite low for being awakened. And so um, we use a ramp stimulation. We had actually a, a hydraulic system set up with a giant oxygen tank, and we could set the control so that it would inflate very gradually uh -huh. so that less than one just noticeable difference. And um, once you get past a certain level of pressure, it's as if, I don't know, it's as if the, the person habituates to it, but we were able to inflate that blood pressure cuff to 300 millimeters of mercury which is the equivalent of having a strong man squeezing as hard as he can on your leg. Okay. That's how intense it was. And um, 
at that point, dreams, they have no choice but to pay attention. Uh, the, the sort of the, the in, inborn uh, uh, filters that we have and, uh, you know, stimulus blockers that we have that pre- protect us while we sleep, those just, they get overwhelmed. And um, so people would start dreaming that they had this blood pressure cuff on their leg and that it was inflating and that it was painful or that they wanted to take it off and they would try to rip it off in their dreams and they would go running out and, you know, confront the experimenter. And the whole dream story was taken over by this overwhelming stimulus. Now, what about your own personal experiences? I assume that you were working it hard to become uh, hard to become lucid yourself. Right. Yeah, well, I, we experimented on each other, the, the yeah. group of students. So I had a, many of those dreams. And um, yes, we, uh, we succeeded in having lucid dreams uh, of many different kinds. Did, what, uh, what do you, did you find them uh, personally useful in terms of your own psychological or spiritual uh, growth in some way? Um, well, psychological growth, I guess. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm more on the sort of atheistic end of the spectrum. Okay. And, um, you know, for me, science was my religion uh, as, a, as a student. And so I found those experiences to be very transformative from that perspective. That is, we were learning things about how dreams were being put together, the mechanisms of dreams. We were getting answers to these questions that have been baffling well, tell tell us about for, those. Tell us what some of those answers were. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, maybe I'm being a little too hyperbolic there, but um, I mean, I, I can definitely identify with Freud claiming that he found the royal road to understanding dreams through his associative system. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I, because we were also finding uh, ways to, um, I guess, identify the the sources of dreams. And it was pretty clear from some of the dream reports that what was being activated during these early experiments was some version of the same system that we use when we're awake to orient and perceive in the world. And that, that's a little more nuanced than saying uh, that we're seeing things and we're hearing things. No, I think most people don't really appreciate how complex our adaptation to this world is and how much of that complexity is completely unconscious. You know, the, the sense that there is a, an up and a down. This is a constant. The sense of our body having a certain weight. Uh, this is a constant that we don't, we don't notice unless we go up in space or maybe we jump in, into a, a pool and swim. And then, then these sensations, these mechanisms have to adjust. But these basic perceptual orientational mechanisms, um, I think we, we noticed were being modified during dreaming and um, had me believe anyway that they were, um, they were to some extent the same mechanisms as, as when awake. Now, you know, that's, that's the insight that we got from these studies. Okay. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, I can prove any of that, but it's, uh, it's difficult to explain, for example, why stimulating a leg really intensely would lead to a dream in which you're hanging upside down by your leg. Okay. And, uh, and, you know, staying in that position throughout the dream. This is not something that normally happens in a dream that you hang upside down, but clearly the stimulation was, creating an imbalance somewhere in this orientational system that we take for granted when we're awake. And it was, you know, inversing, inversing the body image. Would the dreams always have a leg in there somewhere? Very often. Yeah. Yeah. The, the leg being paralyzed, uh, dreaming that there was a big cast on the leg and it was stiff and unable to move, uh, dream, but sometimes it was just very vivid activity, like dancing at a frenetic pace or skiing, um, you know, it, really quickly, uh-huh. you know, on a flat surface, wow. no explanation. Yeah. Um, and very often very vivid uh, kinds of uh, visual imagery as well, which is a little different, a little more difficult to explain. But um, yeah. 
So are there other people who've used uh, different stimulations uh, other than, you know, uh, the leg, the leg cuff that have been effective as well? Well, there's been a few. There were a few before we did those studies. Um, I think uh, William Dement, you know, one of the pioneers of uh, sleep research, he, yeah. uh, as a uh, young student, uh, tried shooting, a, uh, you know, a spray of water on the back of a sleeping person um, using a you know, hypodermic huh. syringe. So, you know, it's getting a really thin jet of water and, and had some good examples of how that cutaneous or temperature related information um, got into dreams. And the person dreamt of being in an auditorium and suddenly it starts raining yeah. uh, and the roof starts collapsing, you know, you can almost see that experiment in, in film inception, you know, but um, others have tried electrical stimulation of the thumb and were able to demonstrate, you know, uh, effects on the hand, hand movements and so forth. But there hasn't been that much research. Those were studies done beforehand. We've replicated a few times uh, using the blood pressure cuff, but um, nobody has really exploited that. I know there's some work being done at the MIT Media Lab um, where they've developed a glove that you can actually wear and it will detect movements of your fingers, but it will also stimulate fingers. Um, I don't think it's gone into widespread production yet, but there's a whole group at MIT that is uh, trying to engineer dreams in that, in that way. Yeah. So I think it's coming. I think eventually. We all, Actually, we'll that, the glove makes me think of a virtual reality. And there was mention in your bio about VR, which I assumed stood for virtual reality. Was that right? Yes. So, <laughs> so yeah. what, what, what have you been doing uh, in terms of VR and dreaming? Right. Well, we, we have a Vive system, a uh, whole room system that we use, and we've programmed a, a kind of a flying task where people will use the controllers, one in either hand, to fly through a kind of a virtual maze. Basically, they have to jump through hoops or fly through hoops uh -huh. um, in a selective way. They have to avoid the red ones and go through the green ones. And um, yeah, we, uh, while they're doing this, we play a sound, you know, a very pleasant sound every time they're successful. And then, um, then we give them a chance to nap in the lab. And while they're napping, we replay the sound, either in REM sleep or in non-REM sleep, huh. and uh, without waking them up, of course. Yeah. Um, the idea being that the sound has been associated with learning. And so if we can um, reactivate the same neural pathways that were involved in the learning of this flying task, and of course, we quantified their performance on the task. Um, then uh, we, we may be able to sort of improve their learning by reactivating these, uh, these neural pathways uh, using the sound, sort of associative uh, learning. And um, yeah, it's, it's a new method, relatively new. I don't know, 10 or so years um, since it was discovered. And it does work. And we did find that by stimulating uh, people with the sound in REM sleep, that when we tested them again after the nap, they did better than a group that was stimulated in non-REM sleep or a group that wasn't stimulated at all. Huh. So, so we're doing, we're, we're using it in that respect. And we're, we're interested in looking at the dreams that people had while they're taking the nap to see if those dreams are also related to the learning. Because a very common idea now is that uh, all the learning effects that we're, we're revealing about sleep um, involve also the dreams that take place during the sleep. There's uh, hundreds of studies now that show um, sleep is important for learning, including these uh, targeted memory reactivation studies that I just described. Um, but um, there's less research really asking the question of, well, is dreaming a, a critical part of this? Could it be we're rehearsing things in our dreams? that just generalized the waking state. And um, so we asked that question at the same time. And um, I think the answer is that we're not rehearsing things in our dreams. It's, that's too simple. It would be too mm -hmm. obvious. Um, mm -hmm. It's not to say that people can't learn to become lucid and then practice skiing or practice juggling or, or you know, tasks like that in their lucid dreams. But 
that's not the same as spontaneous dreaming. And, uh, but uh, we did find that when people dreamt about the task and incorporated parts of the task, like, you know, flying or the red and green rings or the, the background, well, or the movements, actually, uh, the movements were more important than the background, actually. But when they had those kinds of dreams, they did do better. Uh, on the on the subsequent retest, and it had more to do with the kinesthetic qualities of their involvement in the VR than it had with the visual uh, components. So uh, it's not that they're practicing, but they are somehow activating their you know their motor systems, and yeah. uh, that is getting into the dreams in some some way. What about the the quote psychodynamic aspect of of dreaming? That Freud and that and that Jung talked about. Do you, have you? Does your research bear on any of that? Well, I, 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 <laughs> it, yeah. I mean, we have two giants um, in in dream theory, but there's been very little research that's actually been done to prove or disprove the theories. But they're the ideas are still giant, and. When I first started, one of my goals, I guess, was to try to, to test Jung's idea of the archetypes. Um, and <laughs> that I, wasn't I, very ambitious. <laughs> you no, know, but, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's still a, a very viable idea. You know, dreaming is very rooted in biology. We dream whether we want to or not. And uh, one of the bits of work that I've done has to do with the uh, typical themes, you know, trying to assess uh, why we have these same themes over and over again. The idea being maybe that these reflect archetypes like Jung talked about. So dreams of falling, you know, dreams of being chased or attacked or being naked in public and yeah. so forth. The, the connection with the archetypes isn't really that clear to me. You know, it's not the wise old man that we're dreaming about. You know, it's not well, the shadow maybe fits with this being chased by a stranger and, and always you know, threatened by a stranger, that one perhaps. But the idea is, is there, and I think it might be possible as a next step to look for sort of genetic determinants of typical themes. Right? Maybe the brain does have a set of programs that it draws upon in times of stress, times of learning, times of change, uh, and they come out in this typical form that crosses mm -hmm. cultures, sex, uh, you know, even, even uh, time, because we were able to show that we, the same typical themes were being reported back in the 40s and 50s as today. So that's one element. It's, it's um, part of the Jungian um, structure, but Freudian and I, I don't know that I have as much uh, data that really... I mean, I, I draw on Freud a lot. His phenomenology was extraordinary. He, you know, apart from his his theories of dream work, you know, the principles of dream work, mm -hmm. and and not mentioning at all his his sexual ideas about dreaming, which I really think are a kind of a cultural artifact of just where he was at the time and maybe how much right. cocaine he was doing. I don't know, but <laughs> uh, the actual phenomenology, the time and effort that he put into. Um, determining the associations, the relevant associations to every element of a dream. Yeah. It's just remarkable. It's unequal. Um, he, he spends pages and pages just describing the, the memory sources of a single short dream. Yeah. And he does this on multiple occasions. It's one of the reasons his, his book is so long is because it takes a lot of time to tr track down all of these memory associations. And I mean, I am very much interested in that phenomenon of, of finding memory associations, but I you know, haven't done it the same way as him, really. Yeah. Is, so I'm just wondering, what are you, do you, you know, I think uh, an idea that runs through IASD, for example, uh, much of the membership, would be that dreams have some kind of therapeutic value. Some kind of they relate somehow to your waking life, yeah. to your emotional concerns, etc. Uh, do you have your own theory about that? Yes, yes. I, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that line of thinking. Um, 
I mentioned my work with Don Kuyken as a graduate student. We spent a lot of time exploring sort of gestalt techniques and um, dream work techniques related to gestalt thinking and um, work um, based on, I guess, one of Carl Rogers' students, um, Eugene Gendlin, the focusing technique. Right. Uh, we, we did a lot of work on ourselves and amongst ourselves, the students and Don and I, where we use dreams as a sort of a focal point to bring up the emotional sources of, of our dreams. And when you start to do that work, when you start to ask, you know, what, what emotions are underlying such and such image, such mm -hmm. and such action, mm -hmm. um, you really start to make connections uh, that are useful very often leading to an aha experience, but also very often leading to cathartic experiences where you connect with this, this emotion that was maybe there all yeah. along, but you just kind of been pushing away right. for whatever reason. But this, you know, this approach, it's very similar to what I would say, I don't know about most, but a lot of people within the IASD use uh, within the um, Ullman uh, approach that's one of the more common approaches developed by Monty Ullman, um, where you know you, you explore the phenomenology of the dream with the person and you let them seek out the memory sources and the emotions. So yeah, it, but it takes it takes time. You have to really uh, dedicate you know a, a good chunk of time to that important part of the dream in order to start to unpack the emotional contributions and of course journalists will often ask you know what could be the meaning of such and such dream and, and it's always frustrating because it always depends you know you always need to ask more questions about the dream to go into it to fill out those uh, emotional sources and that's not something you can easily do in an interview right? but uh, this is what people in ISD do uh, in their workshops uh, and in their dream groups, dream work groups, this is part of the process of uh, getting insight from dreams. Yeah. Now, one of the things that you've been researching are what you call sleep onset micro dreaming. And uh, I'm not sure what that is. You can tell us about it. To me, it, <laughs> it uh, sounds reminiscent of uh, what I know as the hypnagogic state is another another term, a more scientific term for the hypnagogic? Well, uh, yes, it's, it's an area that's still kind of in flux. There, you know, there's been a, a kind of a detour away from studying, you know, cognition at that, in that hypnagogic state. Um, but my idea of micro dreaming was an attempt to, to alert people to the fact that there is, uh, that it's possible to study uh, dreaming at the very instant that you're falling asleep, not during this drawn out sort of 10 minute uh, sleep onset period, which we all go through when we, when we fall asleep at night, but rather it's that phenomenon where you're, you're sitting in a chair and you're sleepy and then suddenly your head nods forward because you just yeah. lost it for a second. Yeah. That's what a micro dream is. It's the, it's the, imagery that occurs at that instant that your head is falling forward. And I mean, this is what Salvador Dali used in his uh, sort of paranoid method of uh, surrealistic art. You know, Thomas Edison developed the methods of using that, that instant of sleep onset. It's yes. very rich. It's very yes. rich. A single image, as you know, it's worth a thousand words, but a sleep onset image at that point, it's, a, it's not static. In my experience, it's dynamic. It involves motion. It's as if you are seeing a short clip from a video of perhaps a second in duration mm -hmm. that you start arbitrarily right in the middle of a movement and that you end very often at the end of a, of a sort of a ballistic kind of movement, like, oh, I was throwing a ball and, and I wake up and my hand actually flies yeah. off into the air. Right. Uh, or or I, I'm falling into a, like a, a vat of something and uh, I wake up just as my head falls forward. It's a, it's a, it's a clip. And that's worth 10 times a thousand words. You know? And yeah. I've been collecting those systematically and trying to describe them. Uh, they're 
really extensive description, some of them really long and involved. If you take the, the job of phenomenology seriously and try to describe everything. But, um, well, my, my, in my doctoral study, uh, my third year paper was on altered states of consciousness. Charles Tart's book came out around that same time and it was right. very exciting to me. Yeah. And, and uh, so probably some of these ideas came from his book and other sources that I found that there were people who developed the skill to stay in that state rather than to stay in lucidity. I'm not sure what the difference is really, but to stay in that. Uh, and they found it to be an ex another world would open up to them. There's a, uh, Swedenborg, I was blocking on his name. Uh, I think Tart Swedenborg. talked about Yeah, Swedenborg, yeah. who uh, developed a whole hierarchy of angels and devils and so on that he experienced in that state. And, and this was a guy who was very bright, and we're told he was a successful politician and writer and scientist and so on. And uh, so I've been intrigued with that state. I'm, and a personal experience that I've been having is my wife and I watch TV in the evening together, but I, I'm very sleepy after I've had dinner. And so okay. I'm watching this show and I'm moving in and out of the show and I'm having little, what I th think would be these micro dreams right. in which it's like I'm interacting with the show or I'm taking the plot in a slightly different direction. Oh, I, I, I absolutely understand what you're talking about. Um, this hey, is, no, really, it, I mean, you can have the same experience reading. Very often you're, you're following a narrative and then your, your eyes start to get, you know, tired and yeah. you might start to hallucinate uh, that the letters change colors, very often red and green in my case. And sometimes I even dream a different, um, twist in the plot just for a few seconds. Yeah, it, that's what's but, happening to uh, me. What, 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 what I'm trying to do, this was something that Syl um, a neo-psychoanalytic um, researcher, I'll call him a researcher, was trying to exploit. He, uh, he discovered that uh, very often the thoughts that were going through our minds at the moment that we fell asleep would be reflected in the images. And he called this auto-symbolic imagery in that the dream was, was taking that concept or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and turning it into a visual image. And so he gave examples of, you know, um, one that comes to mind is that uh, he was trying to uh, correct in his mind a halting sentence in a, in a text he was writing. And he suddenly had an image where he's planing a board, okay? He's trying to smooth out the board with this plane, which is sort of metaphorically what he was trying to do with his, his writing. Um, anyway, the auto-symbolic idea really um, affected me. And lately I have started trying to prove that his ideas were right in that this could be exploited as an experimental technique um, because he, he claimed it, but he never really proved it. And, you know, it's all, always possible that the idea and the dream we're, uh, we're both springing out of the same sort of unconscious uh, um, narrative. So in order for it to be experimental, mm -hmm. you have to uh, you know, intentionally choose something uh, uh, to try to stimulate a dream. And this is what I've been doing. I'm, I've collected hundreds of dreams now where I am falling asleep and I intentionally think of something as I'm falling asleep. And then as soon as I have an image, I uh, record the image and um, look for associations between the uh, what I call the stimulus and um, and it works surprisingly well so you're experimenting uh, on yourself yes yes in of yeah. one yeah and of uh, one and of course you know uh, <laughs> you have to be very skeptical but I mean when you think of it dreams are accessible only to n of one you know you cannot see right. another person's dreams at least not yeah. yet you can't and I, I don't know if we ever will be able to so um, it is an introspective exercise and you need to, I think, take a skeptical scientific approach to avoid a lot of the biases that people naturally have and aren't aware of. So, um, yeah, I, 
I'm doing this myself. It works like a charm for me, but it, for others, it might be quite different. Other yeah. people might not even be able to experience these uh, instance of, uh, of imagery at sleep onset, Does or this, they might fall into a state. Yeah. You know? Does this touch on the area where there are these stories about Einstein and Robert Louis Stevenson and other people who have a flash that turns into, you know, the theory of relativity or right. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde's story and so on. And they're just all of these examples that people have compiled. It, well, it does to um, some extent. Um, Kekulé, who uh, discovered yeah. the, the carbon ring, you know, he had a hypnagogic image while sitting in front of a fireplace of a snake eating its own tail. And this yeah. allowed him to, to map that onto uh, the the circular um, structure of carbon. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, he was, I, from what I understand, um, quite sick when he wrote in the, in the latter part of his days. So Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde may have been written largely in a, you know, from a bed. He may have been falling asleep a lot, but he does acknowledge that his dreams played a role. I was at the museum. Uh, where was it now? Somewhere in, uh, in Southern California, and I, I was the only person in the museum. The, the the curator there allowed me to put on Robert Louis Stevenson's smoking jacket <laughs> from the display. I don't know, yeah. and Whoa. it was so small; it, it didn't fit me. And I'm not a large man, but he said it, it just shows shows you how small people were back then. You know, uh, humans have actually yeah. grown o over the decades. But yeah. I, I, I wish I'd had an iPhone back then. I would have had a yeah. picture of myself with a <laughs> smoking jacket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yes, yeah. It, it, it's it's like one of those uh, secrets that people know about, but that artists don't necessarily talk about a lot. I don't know if there's an element of feeling like you're cheating when you use your dreams in order to produce something. You know, it's something that's kind of, depending on your beliefs, maybe comes to you in a dream. It's not something that you worked hard to produce. I don't know. But well, um, in, in, the, in these uh, examples of Einstein and so on, uh, and uh, how do you say his name? Kekulé? I've never known, how to, yeah, I've never known how, how to say it. Uh, that it was something that they had been working on intensely and thinking about intensely for years. And then the breakthrough comes with this visual image. Yeah. So there was yeah. a lot of preparation. Right, right. Kind of a dream incubation phenomenon, which, yeah. um, which is as old as dreaming itself, really. It, it reaches back to you know, early ancient Egypt. Yeah. And, um, and people are still using uh, dream incubation today in order to try to solve problems or, you know, induce. Uh, you know, everybody has their own their own goal in doing this back then it was all about meeting the gods of healing or whatever mm -hmm. and and you know healing some affliction yeah you know, sleeping in the temple uh but it yeah it has to do with this um creating an attitude of of approaching the dream to get a solution but but being patient because there is a delay. It's not always that you're going to dream necessarily right away about an answer. Sometimes there's, I don't know, takes several nights for, uh, for this problem to wend its way through the, mm -hmm. the language of the dream. Yeah. But if you ask people to do it, they, uh, I think over 50% of people are successful in solving some kind of problem if you give mm -hmm. them a task. You know, and um, Solving it in their sleep somehow? Right, right. I mean, the old adage, sleep on it, it, it comes from somewhere. And, and I think it is because, yeah, people do have solutions when they wake up from sleep. It's part of this the whole movement of sleep learning that I mentioned. You know, we, we now know that a period of sleep is much better for your memory than a period of wake, necessarily, like, for example. Yeah. You know, I'm realizing that I had, a, a for me, a profound experience of that as a uh, one of the hats I've worn as a market researcher leading uh, focus groups with consumers and, and so on and, and have to write a report later. And the clients would come back from behind the mirror and would want to talk about, okay, what have we learned? And I didn't know what the hell we had learned because I was so immersed in the discussion and couldn't okay. really remember it. 
But I, and that used to panic me. But then I got to the place where I learned that if I slept on it, the next day I would be able to, to write a report and de develop the whole scenario. Uh, right. You know, so I really yeah. learned to trust my unconscious in that right. way. Right. Yeah. No, uh, that's a, a lesson I wish we could teach to our students that pulling an all nighter is definitely not as productive as getting regular sleep. Of course, there are deadlines and so forth, but, yeah. um, you know, people who, who follow that routine regularly thinking that, you know, by depriving themselves of sleep, that they're actually, I don't know, focusing better or something. Yeah. It's, it's really not, not true. Um, yeah. I was never able to pull all nighters. I knew people who did, but I slept. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I needed to sleep. You know, the time is running out on us here, and I wanted to Already? give you a chance oh. to talk a bit about uh, about your presentation for IASD. Okay. Oh, well, I just thought of something. Since we were uh, speaking of, um, hold on, of uh, incubation, Yeah. Um, I've been doing a little uh, experiment myself, and I thought I could share it with your, uh, your listeners, uh, I guess, well, if they're watching on YouTube only, but, um, you know, since COVID, uh, you know, we've been locked inside and you, you may have heard that dreams are changing all around the world. People are having more vivid dreams, just more dreams. They're having I've nightmares. No, I didn't oh. know that. Oh yeah. It's a, uh, well, I can, I can give you a link to uh, an article I wrote in scientific American on that. Wow. Um, it's quite a phenomenon. And, uh, it's, I think it's the first time it, that a change in dreams has ever occurred on such a global scale. There's been wars and regional conflicts that cause people to have more nightmares and so forth. But this seemed to be happening all around the world, all at the same time, um, due to a combination of the, you know, the threat of the virus, which early in March of last year really wasn't understood that well. And also the lockdown measures that were being taken sort of left and right. So there was a fear of infection contagion and also this social isolation. And uh, oh. anyway, a lot of factors. People were sleeping more, some of them. Others were sleeping less if they were on the front line. So all kinds of changes in sleep. But um, yeah, so that got me thinking. And I was forced to think about it because my lab was shut down in, in March. And it's been shut ever since. So oh, we couldn't boy. do our, our typical sleep studies. And uh, we started looking at sort of online sources of dreams that we could study, and, and that's what we've been doing. But also, I started thinking, well, I'm going to double my efforts to uh, to work on my own dreams at home. My dream recall has been really poor lately, and so forth. So I started uh, going back into the literature and finding um, techniques that were used by old old scholars, you know, pre-Freudian <laughs> scholars. Even mm. they were experimenting on their dreams at the time, and. Um, one uh, idea that came up was to just uh, put on a, a black glove. Pretty hard to see that, but no, I can is. see it. <laughs> yeah, just a cotton glove. I mean, you could uh, use any kind of glove. You put it on your right hand or your left hand, uh -huh. or both hands, for that matter. I've been um, I've been trying that, and uh, it's surprising what an effect this has on your dreams. And so How I'm so? going to be yeah. How so? well. Uh, you'll have to tune into the uh, keynote at the IASD. <laughs> <day. laughs> but um, suffice it to say that it does have an effect. I mean, for one, I can give you a teaser. My dreamer call just increased dramatically when I started to wear this the, this club to bed, and um, so I was going to suggest that anybody who might see this before the conference uh, they try it. Everybody's mm -hmm. got a black glove laying around at home. Um, I think. And uh, yeah, if they if they feel like uh, sharing the dream with me, they could email it to me. I, I'm thinking of putting compiling a bunch of these. Some of my yeah. students have already done it, and they've confirmed that yeah, there seems to be something interesting going on there. You um, want to put your email address out here so that our listeners sure. and viewers could do that? Sure. Uh, yeah, Tori Nielsen at yahoo.com. And that's and about T O R E. N I E L S E N. That's it. Yeah. At, at yahoo.com. Yahoo yeah. 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 And uh, yeah. So I, I'd be interested in hearing from you and see what happens. Uh, I have a bunch <laughs> of hypotheses. I'm doing some uh, science on this uh, of my own at home. And I have some predictions just based on my dreams. And I'm really curious to see how those hold up for others. 
Okay, I'm going to try to uh, to attend that. Uh, they're giving me access to the virtual conference, and so I'll, I'll look for your presentation. Okay, sure. Well, I, I'm, uh, I could probably help you get access to that. Okay. Um, and, uh, well, maybe if we're talking about plugs, I could also mention my uh, website, the dreamscience.ca slash 2020 website. That's got, okay. a, that's got a, a questionnaire on there about COVID dreams. And I've, I've been collecting dreams for many months now. So that's dream science slash 2020 dream science dot CA. Yeah. Um, people idea. can contribute. There's, you know, we're looking for citizen scientists out there, you know, people who want to, um, you know, put their powers of observation to work to help the, the global community. There, there's not a lot of dream researchers on this planet and we need I think we need to rethink doing some kind of citizen science, some kind of uh, crowdsourcing of, of dream science. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of dreamers out there who have really good dreamer call and who are basically experts in observing and writing out their dreams. I mean, some people draw them as well, which is yeah. a bonus. And I, I really think we need to harness the, our collective powers of observation well, that, that, you know, that's a great wrap up, I think, for our conversation here. Okay. This, this challenge, <laughs> this call to citizen scientists and, and explorers, dream recallers, because our culture is not tended to value uh, dreaming a whole lot. And uh, maybe, yeah. maybe this is, is in the process of change. So, well, it uh, is. I, I, uh, I was hoping to talk about that, but um, we are in a, a kind of a renaissance right now. We're in the middle of it right now, um, and uh, but that's maybe for another time. And I, I'm very happy to see it because I've been laboring my whole life in this area, yeah, you know, out in the wilderness, and now suddenly uh, there wow. are people all over the place who are, you know, more and more interested in dreams. And so I, I feel a, a sea change happening, and it's, it's great. Some of my students are part of it as well. And so you're in the ideal position of having a a, a sleep lab and dream lab, which will probably get to go back online before too Soon. long, we hope. Yeah. Soon, yeah. Canada is coming along with their vaccinations. We're not as far along as uh, in the U.S., but I think there's something like 35% here in Quebec. Uh -huh. So we're getting there, but it'll, okay. it'll be a while. It'll be okay. a while. Yeah. Well, Dr. Tori Nielsen, I want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio, and I hope you have a wonderful time at the uh, IASD. Conference. Well, thanks very much, David. It was uh, the time flew by so quickly. Uh, I had a great time talking with you.